after a long and controversial discussion among legislators in Virginia in the 1970s. The Court of Appeals of Virginia was established on January 1, 1985. The court serves as an intermediate appellate court providing appellate reviews of the final decisions of the circuit courts in domestic relations matters, appeals from decisions of an administrative agency, traffic infractions, and for criminal cases except where a sentence of death has been imposed. Originally, the court was established under the leadership of Ernest Ballard Baker with 10 judges. Currently, the court consists of 11 judges sitting in panels of at least three judges at locations as the Chief Justice designates. This system provides convenient access to various geographic locations throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Today, I have the distinct honor to talk with five of the original 10 judges on the Court of Appeals of Virginia. The first person I'd like to introduce as part of our discussion is Norman K. Moon, who served on the Court of Appeals from 1985 to 1997 and Chief Judge from 1992 until 1997, when he was confirmed as a judge on the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Virginia. He took senior status in 2010. Judge Moon began his career as a private attorney in Lynchburg, but was soon appointed as a judge in the 24th Judicial District Court in 1974, a position he served until appointed to the Court of Appeals. Judge Moon is a graduate of the University of Virginia, both as an undergraduate, law school, and receiving a Master's of Law at UVA. Our next guest is Sam W. Coleman, who served on the Court of Appeals of Virginia from 1985 until 2001. He was a senior judge on the court from 2001 until 2012. After graduating from the University of Virginia and Washington and Lee Law School, Judge Coleman's path helped him to begin his career as a circuit court judge in Scott County, Virginia. Coleman served on the Education and Compensation and Retirement Committees of the Virginia Judicial Conference on the <clears throat> Legislative Study Commission on Appellate Courts. His illustrious career as judge has spanned 25 years. Our next guest is Barbara M. Keenan, who was a judge on the Court of Appeals of Virginia from 1985 until 1991, when she was appointed justice on the Supreme Court of Virginia. She became a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit in 2010. Now, Justice Keenan is an alumna of Cornell University and George Washington University School of Law. While beginning her career as a prosecutor, she was appointed to the General District Court in Fairfax at the very young age of 29. Thereafter, she became the first female circuit court judge and then again made history as the first female judge appointed to the newly formed Court of Appeals. Continuing these firsts, Justice Keenan was also the first person to sit at all four levels of the Commonwealth's judicial system after her appointment on the Supreme Court of Virginia. Our next guest is James W. Benton, who served on the Court of Appeals beginning in 1985 and retired in 2007. Before he became a judge, he was a partner in the law firm of Hill Tucker Marsh, a distinguished Richmond law firm that pioneered legal challenges to segregation and discrimination in Virginia. The firm was involved in some interesting cases, including the famous 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision and the Green versus County School Board of New Kent County, that challenged the freedom of choice plan that sought to undermine the Brown, the Brown decision. Judge Benton, a Norfolk native and graduate of Temple University and the University of Virginia School of Law, has spent his entire career pursuing his passion for equality, civil rights, and fairness before the law. And finally, we have Lawrence L. Kuntz, a judge on the Court of Appeals of Virginia from 1985 to 1995 and chief judge 
from 1985 until 1992. He was elected justice on the Supreme Court of Virginia in 1995 and is currently a senior justice on the court. He's a Roanoke native and a graduate of Virginia Tech and the T.C. Williams School of Law at the University of Richmond. Judge Kuntz began as a juvenile and domestic relations court judge in 1967, where he served nine years until he was appointed to the circuit court. He is one of two justices in Virginia who has served on four levels of Virginia's court system. Justice Kuntz has a distinguished 43-year career as a judge. Welcome, all of you, to today's Thank discussion. You. Thank you. <clears throat> I know that all of you have had an opportunity to come together on a private and personal level to talk about not only your experiences, but to catch up on what each other is doing. But today, we want to focus a little bit on your experiences as uh, judges and, and really pioneers on this Court of Appeals. All of you were there at the formation. All of you helped to really construct the administrative side of the court and to make it a functioning court, so successful, in fact, that most people have forgotten any controversy regarding the formation of the court. And so I'd like to begin by asking you a little bit about what your experiences were the first time you heard that you were supposed to be a part of this newly formed court here in Virginia. Well, it was very exciting for me. Uh, it, uh, the circuit court in Fairfax County where I sat was a, uh, you know, had sat since the time of George Washington. You know, it was a place that was bound in tradition and, uh, you know, very, very uh, well qualified people I was sitting with. It was just such an established place. And so for me, it was very exciting, the thought to begin to start an entirely new venture. It was a little frightening in a way because Part of me thought, well, you know, what if I don't <clears throat> like this job? I'm, I'm, I'm going to be leaving a job that I really do like quite a bit. So there was an aspect of, uh, you know, charging into the unknown, but it, uh, it was just too good an opportunity to pass up in the sense that uh, it was something that would probably never be done again in our lifetime. So, Judge Benton? Well, I was excited because... Um there was an opportunity for the first time in Virginia to have appeals of right. And um, a lot of my practice had been on the federal side where uh, we had appeals of right in, in virtually all cases. And uh, this was going to be, in my view, a grand opportunity for Virginia to, uh, to go along that route. And of course, for me coming from private practice onto the bench added a, an extra dimension of excitement. How did it add an extra dimension? Well, um, I was joining a group that I knew consisted of nine other trial court judges. And uh, I had some, a little apprehension about uh, going on as uh, the one lawyer uh, on the court. Uh, but uh, I talked to some people, some of the judges, the local judges, and I felt pretty confident that I would be able to do the work. And he's really too modest. He, he more than <laughs> was just capable of doing the work. Um, but um, for me, I, uh, I thought it was a unique opportunity to institutionalize a brand new level of the court system in Virginia, which had not occurred and probably won't occur for, certainly in my lifetime in the future. And I... I guess if history would remember anything, what I would like uh, to be remembered is these were 10, well, I can say nine and me, very, very capable people. And from day one, I think we'd all agree that we were committed to making this court excellent. It, not just that it handled cases, but it do more than that. And we had a series of meetings to decide how we were going to uh, function day to day and just how we were going to process our cases. And uh, I think most everyone on the court would agree that we rapidly came together as a, as a team and everybody was equally committed. And um, I, th I think we could 
safely say that I think we did a good job. Well, I certainly would love to have been a fly on the wall <laughs> to listen to your discussions about how you formed this court. So give me a little taste of what um, you, you all talked about and maybe even some of the, the arguments that went on in, in how you thought the court should really form itself. Well, to begin with, we had no furniture. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can tell you one thing that I remember to think of. One of the questions was, since we were all coming on on the same day, uh, how would we determine who was senior in the uh, seniority system? Well, I didn't give it a great deal of thought. I thought I was sort of in the middle, middle of the age group, middle of the experience of the judges, and with name beginning with M in the middle of the alphabet. So I said, well, you know, I, I could suggest something that wouldn't favor me, that wouldn't have really make any difference to me. And I said, well, I suggest we do it alphabetically. And uh, Judge Barr immediately said, I'll, I'll go with that. <laughs> well, I hadn't started. I think there were four or five judges whose <clears throat> names started with B. And then uh, Baker, two Bakers, Barr Benton, and then I was, M was the last, <laughs> I was the last in seniority. Of course, it didn't make any difference except how you were seated um, at the, uh, in, in court. I don't think there was in, any other difference uh, that seniority made, but that was one of the first. As a matter of fact, I think when we met with Rob Baldwin, the executive secretary, he said that was one of the first things we needed to do was to determine seniority. Well, and then another thing that we did, and, and uh, Sam was talking about this last night, and he could, probably can give more details than, I, than uh, I would remember right now, but he was saying uh, how we invited in people uh, from other states. We invited judges in from other jurisdictions, people who could give us a perspective on how a brand new court should start. You know, as you said, it was a little bit contentious, the the beginning of the Court of Appeals in Virginia. Some people didn't want us, didn't think they needed another court in Virginia, and perhaps saw it as an erosion of their influence to have another court in Virginia. So uh, our natural place to look wasn't necessarily within our own state as to how we should get started. And, and that's what Sam was saying last night. Well, you know, one of the other things too, I think we faced and, and confronted early on was how we would sit as far as whether we would sit in Richmond, for example, and we, there was a, the Supreme Court at that time had a, about a two or three year backlog, and we were very <laughs> aware of that and wanted to try to be user friendly. So one of the things that we wanted to do early on was try to be more accessible. So rather than hold court just in Richmond, we decided that we would hold it in four locations in the state, and uh, so um, that was one of the early things that we did to, to try to be more, more accessible. Um, and I think, you know, we all agreed from the outset that we would uh, take our oath on the same day, mm -hmm. right. and, yeah. and uh, which I thought was fairly phenomenal that yeah. we could it's four o'clock in the afternoon. Collusion. That's right. Yeah. I think one of the mm -hmm. big, so. big things we did early on, too, was um, decide that this, we would comply with the, it's, it's the statute which said we had to give a written opinion explaining why we denied a petition for a writ of error or why, or, or, and also we had to give a written opinion as to why we decided the case. Now that same law, I think, was applied to the Supreme Court and they fulfilled it by their decisions, most of them when they denied uh, a petition, they said, not finding any reversible error, <laughs> the trial judge is affirmed. Well, we decided that the way we, we interpreted, and I don't recall uh, a lot of discussion about it, but from the get-go, we, we every litigant before our court got a written opinion explaining the reasoning behind our decision. I mean, no matter whether it was a criminal case, that uh, you had a right to get a written opinion, and we we turned out a lot of lot of written opinions. And one of the things that 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 this court <coughs> did that was remarkable to me, in a way, I went through the library at the University of Virginia Law School, 
And if you looked at the shelf, the Virgin they had in the stacks the law from each state, uh, case law from each state. The Virginia law was just a small fraction of that of most states that had court of appeals. Smaller states than Virginia just filled up many shelves, many more than Virginia. And the Supreme Court was probably, I guess, back then turning out about 100 opinions a year. Well, we didn't have the precedent on a lot of, a lot of issues. And this court was able <coughs> to develop uh, uh, and add to the to the law, so many precedents that the practitioners and judges could rely upon. You know, uh, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think the other thing that, that we did was we decided when we were talking about sitting in four different parts of the state that we would not have a permanent panel in southwest Virginia or a permanent panel in northern Virginia because we didn't want the law of one section of the state to be different from the other law. And there's several so, judges on the court, though, that proposed that and advocated that we have permanent regional right. panels right. and that we sit, and, and that when we had a conflict, that we would resolve those on bank. And um, uh, we decided not to do it that way, to, to have rotating panels, and everybody had to rotate at least with every other judge on the court once a year. I think one of the things that helped us immensely was uh, several sessions that we had early on. Um, Rob Baldwin, who was the executive secretary of the Supreme Court, set up in, <clears throat> in Williamsburg, uh, I think three days, mm -hmm. uh, where we sat together. And uh, we had uh, judges from other places to come in to talk to us about intermediate appellate courts and how they function. There was a judge from Maryland mm -hmm. uh, who was the chief judge of the Maryland Court of Special Appeals, and I believe the other judge was from Vermont. Uh, and we had just talking sessions about how uh, this uh, multi-judge intermediate court should function. And that, I think that gave all of us uh, an idea of these things that we needed to work on, and, and we went about doing it fairly quickly. And I think one thing they also emphasized uh, to us was the importance of collegiality in a group. And that was really uh, something that all of us listened to very carefully because we didn't know each other. None of us, I mean, we had 10 people coming together to be a brand new institution and nobody knew each other. I don't think I had ever met. I might have met Sam at one committee meeting, but none of us knew each other. So hearing about from the judges from other states reminding us when it's uh, when someone sends you an opinion look at it critique it send back your comments don't say i'm too busy i'll get to you after i do mine uh, small courtesies that make a big difference in terms of efficient operation and also a group pulling together as a group so we learned a lot from those mm -hmm. judges in terms of not just how to operate as a court but how we should treat each other and i think that was one of the real secrets to our success. Yeah, and I think Lawrence gets a lot of credit for that because mm -hmm. he opened the process up to any decision that we had to make. He didn't take it on himself to make without consulting with the rest of us. And I think as a result of that, it was a very collegial group and has been over the years and we continue to get together. Right, and, and Lawrence used to say too about the opinions themselves, it's just too easy to write your own opinion. You know, if you're in a panel of three, it's, it, and we, nine of us, as Jim says, had been trial court judges, and we were used to just giving our own opinions. He said, this is a group product, mm -hmm. and so don't give up. Even if you have some differences, work at them and minimize them to the extent that you can. And that was a, a, a really good lesson for us because right. we were all <clears throat> in, a, in a real transformational process from being individual thinkers to being group thinkers. And Lawrence was... Lawrence uh, sensed the real importance of that from the very beginning. Well, you all kind of say <laughs> that about me, but um, history ought to record that this was simply a, a unique group of people. Uh, every single person on the court wanted the court to be successful and did everything they could to make it successful. And in a very short time, I think we became friends. And 
is not just colleagues. And what Barbara is saying about the opinions, I've always held and still do hold. You have to, you have to like and respect a colleague to really care much about their opinion. And I think we became a pretty close <coughs> group and therefore admit something to us, but mm -hmm. each opinion was important to us. You know, another decision we made early on about the opinions, uh, we were concerned about <coughs> a backlog and there was discussion about, uh, we were getting a lot of unpublished opinions cited to us, so there was some discussion about whether we needed to uh, streamline it and not state the facts in our un unpublished opinions and therefore they couldn't be cited back to us as authority. And there was, uh, there were a number of judges on the court that advocated for that and actually we, for a while a lot of us implemented that practice and I recall Jim Benton never did. And he, he, and I would talk with him about it and he said, the litigants in this case deserve a reasoned answer and a reasoned opinion stating why we have held the way we do. And I think we followed that. Uh, we gone back, went back to that, and never again did we issue unpublished opinions that just said the parties know the facts in this case, and this is our analysis, and, and provide for that. And I think we tried from the outset and cont <coughs> continued to to try to be user friendly. That we really wanted we would invite members of the bar uh, to our conferences, to our workshops, and have them tell us, critique our opinions and where we were going in various areas as far as domestic relations, workers' comp, and criminal law. And I think that, you know, the bar, I think, appreciated that. They were excited, I think, yeah. the bar, sure. because yeah. the Supreme Court uh, was such a remote institution. I mean, I can say as a practicing lawyer and as a circuit court judge, the Supreme Court was was way out there. You know, you just never were in touch with it. You never saw them. They were at conferences. They sat in the front row, but they kind of talked to each other mostly. And it was just a very insular, from an outsider's perspective, a very insular group. And so we were all conscious of that, I think, starting as uh, appellate judges. We didn't want to be perceived as insular. We wanted to make it really clear to lawyers that we were going to be learning from them too. So there were a whole series of problems that we had to come to grips with. But you ask about difficulties. One of the first difficulties that we ran into was the, our first chief judge, E. Ballard Baker, died. He had a, uh, he and I were the two judges in Richmond, uh, and uh, we were, we had offices next to each other. And uh, I think maybe within the first month. I got a call at home one night from uh, Pam Sargent, who was a deputy attorney general, and she told me that Ballard Baker had died. I, mean, I think it was about 10.30 or 11 at night. And uh, the next morning I went to see David Beach and informed him of that. And he was just stunned and wanted some verification. Uh, but <clears throat> Ballard died. He was the person we elected as chief to lead the court, and we had to quickly adjust to that uh, that difficulty. And it really was because it added a just another burden that we had to deal with. That is to regroup and re-elect uh, another chief judge. And of course, we did elected Lawrence to that position. That was an, one of the initial issues that we had to come to grips with. Let me ask you all a, a quick question following up on that. Um, after um, Judge Ballard died, oh, excuse me, Judge Baker died, <laughs> um, he, it was such a sudden death, he died of a heart attack. Um, do you think that somehow that made all of you pull together even closer and collaborate even more? Or do you think the collaboration would have been the same or at the same level? Uh, if he had not uh, tragically died, and especially so soon after the formation of the court? I, I think it probably would have been the same uh, after, chief, uh, after Judge Kuntz was elected uh, chief. I think he went full speed ahead. He was able to, uh, you know, not at the moment, but in due time, as soon as possible, I think he was able to establish, get a 
clerk's office established separate from the Supreme Court, uh, arranged for us to get a build a separate building, and that was all working through the legislature. Okay, let me, let me I, take I don't I don't believe he could have I don't believe that could have happened any mm -hmm. faster. Um, and I think you know we were all of, you know we knew people died and you had to get on with things. So <clears throat> I don't think his death really slowed us down much as an institution. Mm -hmm. And and I apologize I didn't mean to interrupt there, but. I, th I would say that it probably made us a, uh, he was a lot more formal yeah. than we were. Mm -hmm. And he was a, a lovely person, a gentleman, a, you know, a true Virginia Richmond gentleman. But he was of a different generation than most of us. And I think we would have been a more formal group that we would have proceeded more on rules uh, rather than sitting around the table saying, you know, what's up, what makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it did have a profound effect. And it's not that one would have been better than the other, but the institution, I think, probably is very different than it would mm -hmm. have been, uh, but for his unfortunate and untimely death. And that was really the foundation of my question, that do you think that his death triggered more collaboration among all of you? And it sounds like there was at least some degree, as opposed to, you know, did it speed things up or slow things down? I think that, that you all had to work with the legislature regardless of who was the uh, chief judge. Um, uh, Judge Benton, you mentioned that the, one of the first things that you all realized was that there was no furniture. So what were the kinds of things on a practical level did you all have to do? Where, where did you meet where there was furniture? Well, fortunately for me, I was in Richmond and uh, we had offices that were literally four offices for judges and about eight rooms for law clerks, but no furniture. Uh, they were all left without any office space. I don't think any of them, I, well I know for a fact none of them had any designated office spaces and they had to scramble to set up offices. And it, it, yeah. went, it went beyond furniture. <laughs> if you recall, we, uh, we started the process of having the briefs filed and setting up, getting uh, the cases into the system. <clears throat> but there was a uh, there were about three weeks or so when I thought something had gone wrong because I had no case, I had nothing <laughs> to decide. And I thought, well, gosh, what kind of job is this? And then, of course, I wrote that day because it didn't just flowed in. But I can remember that gap. Yeah, and there were transition issues, too, with the circuit courts that we had been sitting with. For example, in Fairfax, uh, our chief judge at the time, Judge Jennings, was not a big fan of there being a court of appeals, and that's an understatement. <laughs> so the day that I, I changed over and became a judge of the court of appeals, uh, the, uh, my administrative assistant was actually using a typewriter that belonged to the circuit court of Fairfax County, and he sent his clerk down to pull the typewriter because it, uh, it was not to be used by the court of appeals of Virginia. So, you know, in, in ways big and small, uh, we had to learn a new way of, of uh, getting along with people. Now that sounds as if um, um, he may have represented uh, some of the conflict that you all encountered early on. And so explain a little bit more about the source of the reticence that some had about the court. Well, I know that it, it, my investiture, and this is just on a personal level, before, I guess, addressing it more broadly, but at my investiture, when he in introduced me, the chief judge of the, the circuit introduced uh, me, and he said, that court that's supposed to be a higher court. I mean, he said that to the, the audience of my family, friends, and, you know, people from all over. Who, and so it was, I mean, it was that kind of open Feeling. Contempt. <laughs> but it, it, there were, you know, it was a, it was a real split. I, I think maybe everybody mm -hmm. would agree. Some, I think most of the practicing bar welcomed us, as Jim said, because they, they couldn't get a writ so often from the Supreme Court of Virginia because it was getting the cases from every circuit and was turning them down, uh, many of them, uh, working as hard as it felt it could. But there were just so many cases that weren't getting a second look. 
I think there were very few lawyers mm -hmm. around the state who oppose yeah. the the court very few but there were very few circuit judges i believe that that advocated, advocated. for it in mm -hmm. fact they saw it as another level of review and having been a circuit judge at the time i felt somewhat insular i guess from review because the supreme mm -hmm. court at that time was as i recall the percentage of cases they would review was like two or three percent mm -hmm. so the chances of my getting a decision reviewed from the supreme court were small so i felt that i had my own little fiefdom in a way and i say that I think there were a lot of other judges in the state, <clears throat> circuit judges, who did feel that way and didn't welcome the Court of Appeals. It was a yeah. very controversial, I think, among, among mm -hmm. trial courts I was, at the time. I was very reticent about it, I, too. I was too. And, and one thing, I thought that it was going to be sort of nickel and dimed, and it wouldn't, would not be much, much of a court. And for, and for some reason, I was put on a committee that was dra to draft rules for the court in the year before any of the judges were elected. And although I wasn't so much in favor of the court, I, had, I did decide that if there were to be a court, I'd rather get on it than to stay where I was, although I, I really liked, liked the uh, trial court. And, uh, but uh, I know I was one of the people who was not, not a bit enthused over the court to begin with. Well, I, I had that same experience, really. I mean, I, I went on the court with some reluctance, to tell you the truth, because I enjoyed being a circuit court judge. I, I did have my own little area there that I uh, was the circuit judge in, and uh, I wasn't sure that I liked it. Plus, there was a lot of reticence, I think, because of the jurisdictional aspects mm -hmm. of it. I mean, workers' comp, yeah. domestic relations, criminal. The, the, a lot of the circuit judges wanted civil jurisdiction, and if they wanted to be on the Court of Appeals, they would would have wanted civil jurisdiction. I think most of us went on with probably some expectation that that jurisdiction might be expanded in the future because there was a lot of discussion. And I think <clears throat> in several sessions of the legislature after that, there were bills introduced to expand our jurisdiction to civil. And many of us anticipated that, but I think looking back on it, it was a stroke of genius in a way, the way they divided the jurisdiction and provided for the appeal of right in certain cases and then by writs in the criminal cases. And the cases we got were, the, were cases involving real people. people. Yeah. And I think that's why it was such an important function that we were fulfilling. They were popularly perceived as the cases the Supreme Court wasn't as interested in. Domestic relations, you know, fighting husbands and wives, dysfunctional families, you know, workers' compensation, injured people, but perhaps not legally interesting in terms of cases, criminals, uh, uh, I think it was fair to say the Supreme Court wasn't uh, as interested in the development of the criminal law. So we seemed to get the cases that were the handoffs of, of, of what they were less interested in, but they turned out to be the cases that made the biggest difference, generally people's speaking, lives. with few exceptions, in people's lives. Yeah. And so we were all very happy that we got those cases. No, you made the point last night, dinner that I, that I thought was right on, and you might want to make a comment about today about equitable distribution. Well, it, it turned out that equitable distribution was coming through the legislature about the same time as the court, and it had already, the law was in effect, as I recall, before the court actually started up. But this was a, a such a earthquake in the law of domestic relations, and the property, uh, property obtained by the persons during the marriage. There was, and there was no precedent you know, in Virginia for how this would be handled. Every trial judge was trying to interpret this law and there were reasonable people could come to different interpretations. And if we had not had the Court of Appeals at that time, and this had to trickle through the Supreme Court, I just <coughs> wonder how long it would have taken for that law to get to a point where people could rely upon it. Because even, even when I left the court in 97, I know it was still, there were still many issues coming up and it was the bread and butter of the Court of Appeals. Whereas if, if it had been left to the Supreme Court and there'd been no Court of Appeals, there probably would have been one or two cases a year. And, and it's things just would never have been, yeah. you'd never be sure. Uh, if your decision, you know, was valid or not. And 
And as Jim was saying, they were appeals of right. Mm -hmm. And that was just a absolute landmark change in Virginia law because other than appeals from the State Corporation Commission in capital murder cases, there were no appeals in right, of right. right in Virginia, right. As, as I recall. So now, for the first time, people had a right to a second look, to have another judicial body say whether their case was correctly decided, and that was huge. And, and, and as an example of the impact that the court had, at least on the practicing bar, I can remember I think maybe for the first five years of our existence, we had lawyers who would come in to argue cases who had never had an appellate argument in Virginia. I mean, lawyers practiced 10 or 12 years, and they would come and they would express to us their pleasure at being able to come into a court and argue their case on appeal and say, you know, during the time I'd practice, I'd never had a, had a case. I mean, in 15 years, I had two writs granted by the Virginia Supreme Court in my practice. So uh, it, it, was, it was monumental from the perspective of, of the practicing bar. I was just wondering if you all could tell us a little bit about the whole process. Since there were so many different cases that had no precedence here in Virginia, how, what process did you go about to create these precedents so that future court of appeals, judges, district court judges, et cetera, could use those rulings to help guide them? Because you all were making groundbreaking decisions in, in, and I can't help as a historian thinking, this is similar to what the Supreme Court in the United States had to do, had to create at, after the, the formation of the court following the 1789 ratification of the Constitution. And they had to, in, in some ways, start from ground zero. But in other ways, there were other operations, court operations internationally and especially in, uh, uh, in England. And of course, the court operations in colonial America. But what did you all do? Well, I think you have to start uh, in the context that the legislation provided and still does that in the area of domestic relations and administrative agencies, the Court of Appeals is the last word unless uh, the Supreme Court determines that a particular case is so, so important of great presidential value that they'll take it. So as a practical matter, it was intended that this new court resolve those issues. So we started off, uh, at least I think, first and foremost with, with a very s sensible or sensitive uh, thought that this is really this court's responsibility in this area of the law to make it clear. And so I think, I think with the experience of the judges and, and Judge Benton, who, or on the court too, we were all aware of the problem areas. We'd all been trying cases in which we always wondered, well, am I deciding this right or am I deciding it wrong? So we sort of jumped at the opportunity to make it clear. And we worked through a process of first identifying this really is ex more significant than some of the other cases we were hearing. Mm -hmm. And in those cases, we made special efforts to make it clear what, what the law was. You know, it was, when I think about the equitable distribution statute, it was certainly a challenge and a daunting task in a way for us. But when you think about it, it was even more so for the trial courts because here they had to apply the law and they were all over the board. So it was up to us to try to come together and uh, make something uh, logical out of that. And we often looked at other states. I mean, so many of the other states had equitable distribution statutes. So I think in those early years, in the early decisions, we would try to look to what other states did. and. You know, uh, and as a trial judge, too, that domestic relation cases, and that's one of the reasons I think so few trial judges offered themselves to be on the court. It was not the sexy uh, issues that you wanted to decide. I mean, if you heard one child custody case and a, a contempt citation for failing to pay child support or alimony, as it was then called, uh, it was not your best day in circuit court to do that. But 
from an intellectual point of view on the on our court, it affected more people than any other area of the law uh, in the Commonwealth. And uh, I think those early decisions that we made were all basically landmark decisions in the equitable distribution area. Uh, you know, concepts like transmutation <laughs> and even dis dis dividing equitable pro equity of the property was, you know, unheard of. You either awarded alimony to the wife and and then gave her the children. <laughs> you know, I remember, I, did you, you might have written the opinion. I forget which one wrote it, but uh, we spent a lot of time in an equitable distribution case deciding where you start, where the child judge should start. Should there be a presumption of 50-50 or should there be a presumption of 100% to no percent and just where to start? And I remember that, I can't remember which one of us wrote the opinion, but I think we decided, didn't we, that there should be no presumption, presumption. Yeah, but it was all right to start, start. at 50-50 yeah. and then yeah. go from there. Yeah. I think it would have been much easier if there had been a presumption <laughs> that the husband and wife shared the marital property, and if one thought that they were entitled to more than the other, they would have to prove that they that they were entitled to more. But it was, you, that wasn't it. You couldn't. You couldn't come out with that presumption as a start. You couldn't really say that was a starting point, right. like you know, Judge Kuntz is saying. And uh, I think I think it would have simplified the law for everyone, particularly the lawyer. If you could tell your clients this presumption, you may not even have to. You could have settled the cases, and the trial judges didn't know. And so the law was always in this state of flux because I don't know today whether that's been settled or not, but, but uh, I think it could have, the law should be as certain as possible. Well, plus to, the big issue for, was, I'm, I'm sorry. No, I was just well, to prevent mm -hmm. uh, conflict. I mean, if you know what the law is, then you don't have to go to court if you can agree on the facts. And the big issue was what is separate property? Mm -hmm. what, what do you have to do after you're married to keep your property separate so that it doesn't become part of the equitable distribution calculus when in yep. mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. and when does the property transmute or, or change its character its legal character from being separate property to marital yeah. property you know another effect that the equitable distribution statute had i think on on the law at that time was uh, you now had a lot of money that you were talking about in divorce cases a lot of times mm -hmm. and a big estate so a lot of practitioners that know that didn't uh, practice domestic relations law, uh, all of a sudden became practitioners <laughs> and followed the money trail, I guess, to our court. So we had these new statutes that we had to deal with, with no precedent, but we also had what I would call the old law, that is workers' compensation, mm -hmm. where there really was not a substantial body of law in Virginia, and we had to look to the decision in other states. We looked at Indiana, yeah, Indiana which right. our statute was, yeah. was modeled on, on the Indiana statute. And so we, uh, we looked at the decisions of that state and slowly but surely we began to work through and fill in all of those gaps in the law that, that, uh, that had existed. And there were some really difficult, uh, there was difficult precedent with the Supreme Court for example, the Supreme Court had defined in the workers' compensation area uh, sexual harassment as being an injury by accident and therefore covered by workers' compensation. Well, to me, and I think a lot of people, it made no sense because the Supreme Court had also defined injury by accident as a sudden structural or mechanical change in your body. Well, how could sexual harassment be evidenced by a sudden structural or mechanical change in your body, it couldn't. Well, we had to figure out a way to articulate some of our decisions without flying in the face of what the Supreme Court had said and do so in a, in a way that was, was true to the law but recognized the fact that they were the superior court. So it, it, it got dicey sometimes. Well, you know, we were uh, in that vein we were extremely careful uh, in what we were holding and how we were saying it. And I remember one of the early opinions that I wrote, the, the court held that if, if, the, if the employee had a, 
a temporary partial disability um, that that being locked up for a crime um, was not was not grounds was grounds for for um, terminating the benefits because they couldn't make themselves available for selective employment. But in that opinion, I think you'll find, well, I know you will because I wrote it, that we do not decide uh, what the effect on total disability would be if you were incarcerated. And Judge Moon, sometime after that, straightened us all out and said, if, if you're totally disabled and you go to jail, you lose your benefit. <laughs> I don't so. recall that, but I'll take credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds as if um, in these early years that so much of what you were doing was collaborative. It was groundbreaking, but it was also very difficult, and you had a huge uh, caseload that you were trying to navigate through. So what kind of administrative support did you initially have, and how did you acquire more? Well, we each had a law clerk, a secretary, and um, I'm trying to remember, I guess we had a central legal staff, didn't we? No. We didn't? No, we didn't. No, not, In fact, not immediately. Not immediately. Yeah, John Tucker was the first. Yeah. Oh, okay. Bob Bixby that came was. later. Well, Bob Bixby was. Mm -hmm. yeah. In, in fact, we shared the, the administrative clerk for the court was the same clerk of the Virginia Supreme Court when we, when we started. Uh, so David Beach acted as clerk for both courts, and then he assigned um, uh, Pat Davis, to, who was his deputy, uh, to function as our, as our liaison. Uh, so we, we were really uh, trying to put it all together and at the same time uh, pull away a bit from the, from the Virginia Supreme Court. I think it was later, as you said, when Bob Bixby became our, mm -hmm. our um, central staff lawyer. But we operated for a while without any, any central staff to, to help us. One thing, Rob Baldwin was executive secretary then of the Supreme Court, and he'd put a lot of thought into this court over the few years while it was being debated. He, I think he was pretty sure it was coming on. And I thought we received as much support as we could from the executive secretary's office. And I think the chief justice was doing all he could to, to help us. I think, uh, to Judge Kuntz's credit, I think he was able to work with the legislature, some of the people over there that really uh, came, went to bat for us. Mm -hmm. And um, that was, so we got the support out of the executive secretary's office. And one thing, even before the, uh, I don't think we can say enough about what Rob Baldwin did. Even before we were elected, knowing we were coming on, he made reservations for us at NYU for the appellate judges conference for three or four of us to attend before he would, uh, he would know, before he even knew who we would be. We, we would, that summer, that first summer, I don't know, three or four of us went up to NYU and uh, attended the appellate judges programs that they had. He, and, he, was, uh, he was really right. interested in our mm -hmm. court. I was in Richmond. Uh, First with Ballard Baker, and then after Ballard died, uh, Marvin Cole was assigned. And ba Rob Baldwin would come down on occasion and sit down and just ask, you know, how are things going? Uh, but to give you an example, Rob came to us and said, I have some money for computers. He says it's designated only for computers. And, uh, you know, I would like for you all to, to have it, and you can start up with IBM computers. Um, he apparently the Supreme Court had not taken him up on that, <laughs> and uh, and we so we were the first court to have a uh, a computer system set up internally so we could communicate with each other in distant areas through the system, and I think maybe five years or three years after we started with our computer system, the Supreme Court finally got on board, and they then. Um, got money to set up their own system. So 
he was very, very instrumental, I think, in, in helping us overcome a series of problems. Th those computers at that time didn't have the capacity to send our opinions, did they? Because as I recall, at first, we circulated our opinions in writing to each other. But well, uh, that was before we got the computers, because we had profs. I don't know if you remember, there yeah. was a system called profs that I allowed did. us to do right. that. Yeah. So it was a short time that we just circulated the opinions in writing. Yeah. Yeah. And it really slowed down the business of the court. I mean, some, I was in McLean in Fairfax County then, and to mail something to the Tidewater area, actually one, I think one transmission took a full week, yep. you know, just by U.S. mail. And it, it wasn't reliable, and you can't run a business like that when just that one mailing was just to get another judge's impression, and then that judge had to mail it back. And then I had to make changes and mail it back to the other. So you can just picture three, four, seven day increments of time and the courts in the very beginning was not moving quickly. So we really seized on the idea of computers mm -hmm. as, as something that could help us function much more efficiently. I and think we were very aware too of the need to stay current, particularly since the Supreme Court had been far behind. And, and one of the things we implemented early on, Judge Barra's suggestion, and, uh, he was one of the first judges on the court from the Tidewater area. At the time, all of the criminal cases would require, we required a three-judge review. And he <coughs> proposed and we implemented that first it be sent to one judge, and then if they wanted to appeal from the one-judge denial of the order, they could then have a three-judge hearing. And I think the percentage of denials at the one-judge level was very effective. I don't remember what it was, but I think it was um, only 30 percent maybe of the ones that were denied appealed for a three-judge review, and that sped up the process a great deal. But even with the one judge, the, the client got a written opinion yeah. explaining why his appeal was denied, and sometimes they would be convinced that their conviction was justified. So. I was just wondering, since uh, Judge Benton, you were such an advocate for explaining in the opinion the process, um, what made that such an important element for you in how this court functioned? Well, I, I, uh, I had a fundamental belief that litigants were entitled to have a decision. Um, you could go through the criminal process and never get anything in writing that you could, you could look at. You were indicted by a, a grand jury. Uh, you would have a probable cause hearing. They'd find probable cause. Then you'd go to trial. The jury would say guilty. And at no point during that process would there be anything in writing that a defendant could look at to say, okay, this is what was found. So I always thought that it was uh, critical for the legitimacy of the court to have a written explanation in those criminal cases when we were saying to a criminal defendant who was going off to the penitentiary maybe for 40, 50 years, why that was the case. Secondly, I believe that by giving a written opinion, if the case went to the Supreme Court, they would have a sense of why we were uh, denying a review to that case. So I've always believed that um, when you go through the judicial process, at some point it's important for the litigant to have in writing an understanding or reason why this case is being disposed of in the way that it, that it was. Jim, I think too, all of us that had practiced law before, had had the experience of a case that we wanted to appeal to the Supreme Court, and we would get back uh, finding no reversible error, we affirm. Yes. And, and we all had experienced that, and it was not a satis particularly when you felt like you had a meritorious appeal, to have nothing more than that explanation was something that we wanted to avoid. Mm -hmm. um, Judge Moon, you were talking earlier about your experiences as a judge and how you had a chance to sit down and and make some suggestions about how this court should function. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more, and, and Judge Coleman as well, you made mention of this. Um, talk more about 
how your background really played an important role in the way in which this this particular court was formed and some of the procedures put in place and, and even the way that you approach cases. Well, I don't think that <clears throat> my background was that different from many other people. It just having the Chief Justice appointed a committee to draft rules for, the, for this court. And pretty much we started out with the rules of the Supreme Court and the, so many of the procedures were going to be pretty identical. It was just a matter of tweaking the language in some respects. Not in, there were some, you know, major differences because we, as they said, a, there was an appeal of right in most instances, not not in the petition, other than in the criminal cases. So I don't think that I had any particular insight that other judges didn't have uh, at that point, and I can't can't think, don't think I added it much any, any more than the other people on the on that committee there were practitioners on the on the on the committee too so there was a lot of give and take about what how the rules should be written but um, I can't take credit for any, any experience that I, I think made the court any better well, I have a, a question for all of you, and I guess I'll just go down the line, starting with you, Justice Kuntz. Um, well, you can start with Judge Mason. <laughs> <laughs> I have less seniority. We always make the person with less seniority speak first. Oh, okay. And, well, and he, then. he was the chief well, judge, so I think you should well, start with start. him also. I, I should start. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so this is an example of the discussion that went on on this court. Yeah, they're my former friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I'm, I'm curious about what really, um, who in your background really impacted your career and the way that you look at the law? Well, that's a, that would be a hard question. I can tell you how I decided to go to law school, sure. which um, it wasn't probably a very good reason, but I was at Virginia Tech in the Corps, and um, me and the military never did get along. You know, we, all the all the polishing and the parading and all that. So I was elected to the, be a defense attorney on the honor court. So I literally started defending people who were in trouble with the honor court. And um, I did that for my junior and senior years there. And I really just became wrapped up in uh, making sure that people were treated fairly when they came before that honor court. Now, why was I so worked up about that? When I arrived at Tech as a freshman, about 60 days after I'd been there, about 3 o'clock in the morning, we were rousted out of bed. We were required to put our uniforms on. It was raining and cold. And every cadet marched down to what we call the lower quadrangle, which was a square inside of the uh, dorms and uh, they brought this young man in uh, uh, I think he was a sophomore and they brought him in they literally took all of his cadet buttons and all off his uniform and marched him out and as, as they marched him out each company turned turned their backs on him and they put him in a cab and he left. And I asked later, well, why would he do that? Well, his, his option was you either go through that process uh, or we'll put this on your record that you were a cheater or whatever it was. So he avoided a uh, bad record. But I was moved by that. I mean, I was, uh, well, obviously to this day, I've never gotten over it. So it made me uh, determine that if you're going to do that to someone, there ought not to be any mistakes made. You know, you ought to be sure you're doing it right. And so that's sort of how I got wrapped up in, in the justice system. It sounds as if you were brought up with certain passions about fairness. Is that a correct assessment? Well, 
I must have been. I can't. I can't sit here and tell you um, what specifically was existed in my background that made me feel that way. I, I just know it's true, and uh, it's never wavered since I got into the law. And has there been anyone who um, has really influenced the way that um, <clears throat> you have operated as a judge or as an attorney? Well, there were some there were some judges that I admired greatly when I started practicing, and the one that probably had the biggest influence on me was a district court judge who. Uh, he had been my Sunday school teacher, and, and uh, so when I started practicing, I was appearing before him a lot. And um, he was always just, I thought anyway, so fair, and I just wanted to be like him. So if I had to say one person in the system uh, made a difference to me, it would be Judge Fitzpatrick, and um, which is why later on in life, uh, he was part of my uh, ceremonies each time I went on a different court. He was participating. Very interesting. Judge Benton. I, I had the good fortune to practice with uh, two lawyers that um, I think were uh, just outstanding. Um, Oliver Hill, who uh, handled one of the Brown versus Board of Education cases in the, in the United States Supreme Court, and Sam Tucker, who uh, was an extraordinary lawyer who, who read law, never went to law school, and he litigated uh, Green versus New Kent County and several other cases. Um, when I went to the firm, I spent the first eight years there trying uh, school desegregation cases and housing discrimination cases. And a big part of what we did was to try cases on appeal because uh, quite often we were in courts that were not, uh, that were in some instances hostile to the claim of our clients. And uh, we had to almost in every case appeal verdicts to the to the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Um, and they were, for me, uh, my, my heroes uh, in terms of the law. So I learned a lot from them, and I learned a lot about just the whole appeal process working with, with, those, two, with those two men. Uh, Oliver was awarded the Presidential Medal, Medal of Freedom, you know, highest civilian honor that one can get in the country. So they were just tremendous. There was a tremendous uh, feeling within the law firm, and uh, and that was very helpful to me as I went on to went on to this court. That that's extraordinary, mm. Justice Keenan. Well, uh, I guess the, my influences started a little bit closer to home. Uh, my grandmother lived with us when I was growing up. And uh, she and my other three grandparents, none of them had ever been to a day of school in their life. And, but she was fascinated with courtroom television. She loved trials. And I would sit there as her little sidekick, and she would critique the lawyers, and she would get me to tell her, you know, at the commercials, what the lawyers should have said. How would you ask the question differently? And when I think about it, she was, she was awfully smart, you know, to, to be able to pick up those nuances. So we watched our favorite daytime TV shows. And she had told me over the years, she died when I was a teenager, but over those, you know, years of being maybe 10 to 15, she said, lawyers are so important. And anytime she ever had a problem, she went to see a lawyer. And, uh, and she said, you should be a lawyer because lawyers help people who can't help themselves. And that really stuck with me. And it really piqued my interest in being a lawyer for that reason. And, and then when I finally got through law school and, and uh, got my first job in the Commonwealth Attorney's Office in Fairfax, I met uh, one of the uh, new judges was Judge Lewis Hall Griffith. And 
I think he was possibly the best judge I ever appeared in front of. And I met him on my very first day as a lawyer. And he was so uh, polite to people. He was considerate, but he didn't, uh, he didn't waste a lot of time either. And he treated people with dignity, explained things to people, and he helped them order their lives and get along, uh, go forward in their lives from whatever dysfunctional system uh, or whatever dysfunctional problem had visited their lives and, and, and really uh, created a lot of problems. And, and that had a profound impact on me. I saw how he operated, how people reacted, and, um, and how, you know, it was just a fundamental core of social order to have a place where people bring their problems. So I, I think that those were two major forces in my life. Well, I, I have to ask, what was your grandmother's name? Oh, her name was Barbara. I was named after her, and you know, of course, I could do no wrong. It was, and she was shameless. I mean, she, she, you know, there were four children in my family, but, I, you know, I, I got the uh, the treats first, and, and you know, I, I, I apologize for it now, but it, <laughs> it, we were best friends. What an amazing story, Judge Coleman. Uh, well, uh, I grew up, I guess, uh, thinking that I would never be anything but a lawyer. Uh, I, became, I came from a long line of lawyers. My grandfather was, my father, his two brothers, uh, my brother, uh, my son. But um, so it was just natural for me, I guess, to pursue the law as a, as a career. Uh, my father died when I was in the first year of law school. And before that, I really had sort of planned to go to Atlanta with some other friends that were going there and, and uh, try to practice law there. Um, after my father died, my uncle prevailed on me to come back to the small town practice that he had in Gate City, which is far southwest Virginia. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed the practice of law. In fact, I guess the judge that I appeared before most often was Joe Cridlin, who was, like Lou Griffith, was a real, a real gentleman and somebody that fairness just uh, exuded from him, really. You, you felt like you were being treated fairly at all times. So I guess he was sort of my role model, but I wasn't sure that I really wanted to go on the bench when the opportunity presented itself. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the practice of law. Um, I would have to say, if I had continued, it was very stressful. Uh, and I was involved a lot in politics at the time, so between the practice of law and, and politics, uh, uh, I'm not sure I'd be here today to tell you the truth. I, I, went on the bench, and I thoroughly enjoyed being on the trial bench. It was, uh, I was there for 10 years prior to, uh, to going on this court, and um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed attorneys appearing before me and litigating cases, so I wasn't sure I really wanted to be on this, case, on this court. Um, I did as a trial judge. I wrote a lot of opinions more so than the other colleagues that I had in that, that circuit, and uh, so I found some um, that I, I, I like for that, that I thought I would enjoy uh, writing opinions. So when the opportunity presented itself to go on this court, uh, I, I thought I would follow that. And um, one of our colleagues we were talking about last night, Bill Hodges, he said, uh, <laughs> he said, except for the reading and writing on this court, it's a great job. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all reading and writing, <laughs> and it was a real, it really was a shocking change to go from the circuit court where you were in court every day with litigants and, and lawyers before you uh, with motions and controversial issues to go to a court uh, where our most exciting experience was the UPS man <laughs> stopping by once or twice a week and bringing you a, a stack of cases because I lo relocated my office in Bristol because I thought I needed to be more central to the area where I served. Well, the lawyers never darkened my door. It was really unlike the situation in Richmond where you're, you have uh, several judges there and, and, and a, uh, court personnel, but literally uh, there were days that nobody walked in the door, which really was a great atmosphere for reading and writing right. <laughs> and getting your opinions ready. So I, I, it didn't bother me to have that situation, but uh, uh, I, I thoroughly enjoy, have enjoyed ever since then that, that process. Well, before I move on to, to Judge Moon, I have to ask, what persuaded you 
to become a judge, a trial judge? You know, I, I suppose my, the legislator, who was a friend of mine from Scott County, asked me when Joe Cridlin retired, the one that I just indicated, if I um, had any interest in being a circuit court judge. Uh, I wasn't sure really that I didn't want to do that. I mean, as I say, I, I, I enjoyed the, the law practice, um, but I thought, you know, I could try and see if I did, if I enjoyed it, and uh, if not, I could always go back to practicing law, but I did. I mean, it was uh, uh, to decide cases and get involved in that process, and uh, whether you did a good job or not, if you felt like you did the right thing in a case, well, it was very satisfying and gratifying, so. Um, I, I have to say, though, I did start that career with some reservation about whether I wanted to do that. But I, I really had three great careers, first as a, as a trial attorney, and then as a, a trial judge, and then as a, on the Court of Appeals. So it's been a wonderful career at all levels, and having colleagues like this was, was part of the reward. Judge Moon. Well, I think I became a lawyer when I think back about it, I think probably the most, the greatest influence was suffering the injustice of being a middle child <laughs> and the things I was deprived of just by saying, well, you're not as old as your brother. And then my younger brother, for some reason, he got everything my older brother got. And so I spent my life thinking I was being treated unjustly. And um, I can remember, I don't, don't know why, but I, I, I remember seeing a movie, Quo Vadis, in which Peter Ustin and I played the role of Nero. And the arbitrary power that he, he exerted over people was just horrible. And um, for some reason, I mean, out of that movie, I got the idea I wanted I, hate, I knew I hated arbitrary power, and I thought the law, a lawyer could do something about that. Now, I've seen that movie again, and it made no impression on me at all, and I don't know why. I took something away from it at that time that I, I don't see in the movie anymore. It's still, I'm sure, a good movie. But then, uh, while I was still in high school, I met the only other federal judge from Lynchburg, A.D. Boxdale. He had happened to, his daughter and I debated together as a team, and we would go over to his house and he, uh, he would critique that style. And uh, so I'm, pretty soon I thought, that's the guy's job, his job is one I'd like to have. And so um, I, I don't know, I remember telling my father, my father one day asked me, what are you going to do? What are you planning to do? I said, well, I'm going to be a lawyer. And, uh, and I set out to do that. And every move I made was toward becoming a lawyer. And I think in the back of my mind, it was, uh, I was always thinking about Judge Boxdale and wanted to be a judge. And I think I wanted to be a federal judge, <laughs> which ultimately, uh, you know, it came that way. But I think of the, uh, you know, what judges might have influenced me. I remember that question was posed to me by one of the senators on a questionnaire when I was before the Senate for confirmation. And I answered the, the judge that I most admired was Earl Wingo, who I know Judge Kuntz remembers, but he had been a general district judge and juvenile judge in the city of Lynchburg. And the great thing about him was his consistency. If if you could agree, if a client came to your office and gave you the facts, you could say to the client, if that's the truth and that's what's before Judge Wingo, I can tell you what he's going to do. You don't need a lawyer. If, that's, if, they, if they are the facts, you don't need a lawyer. And 99 times out of 100, you were right. And that's what I think the law ought to be, is consistency. It ought to be that people shouldn't have to go to court to resolve so many things, that you should be able to operate a business 
knowing what the law is. Well, if you're married, you should know what the marital law is and how your property will be split up without having to go and have some judge sit down and try to figure it out for you. And that's sort of been my guiding principles in my own mind is the idea that the judiciary stands between the people and arbitrary government. And it's, the law should be so consistent that you don't have to litigate if you know what the facts are. Well, it sounds as if all of you have had some extraordinary role models and people who've inspired your lives. And I was wondering, um, as we kind of wind down our discussion, what are some of your favorite memories of being on the court and interacting with your colleagues? Well, mine started early. I don't know what's my favorite one, but I guess we haven't been trying cases for a couple months, and uh, a lawyer came in to, before the panel, and Judge Coleman and I were on the panel, and I forget now who the other one was. It might have been Judge Barrow. But anyway, this lawyer came in and made a, uh, a passionate plea that we that we um, give him a relief from the trial court. And he went on and on about. It. He said this was tried by one of the best circuit judges <laughs> in this state. He is absolutely one of the best judges I've ever appeared before. And I, he said, but this is the only error he's ever made in his whole career. <laughs> And I looked down at the sheet, and Judge Coleman was the trial judge. <laughs> uh, you told me that. I don't think I was on the panel, or I wouldn't have been well, maybe not, decided the case, but you told me that later. Yeah. You remember that lawyer? Uh, oh, yeah, Ron, Lonnie Kerr. Yeah. <laughs> my, second, my second memory, and this may seem uh, sort of silly to you, but it set the tone for the court, at least for me, we were at one of those uh, early on meetings, organizational meetings, mm -hmm. and we were in Williamsburg. And we were having, a, our actual meeting was on a lower level where we were, uh, our rooms were up above. And we all, for whatever reason, hit the elevator at the same time. Here we came down. And, um, and Judge Keenan was on the elevator. And of course, I know I had been taught, I think everybody on the elevator had been taught, you know, you let you let a lady get off first. So we were literally climbing over each other, trying to, <laughs> trying to get, make room for a barber to, to get off. And the point of the story is, she looked at us and she said, if you boys will just get off the elevator, we'll be all right. <laughs> and so then I knew we were going to get along with it. What about the rest of you? Favorite memories? I don't know, I, my, my, some of my best times were uh, in our annual retreats. We, we decided early on that every year we would go away for a few days and um, just talk about what we were doing and how we were doing it and get to know each other a little better. And I think that over the years they were some of the events that I really enjoyed, an opportunity just to uh, put your feet up, take your necktie off, be informal, and talk about how we were processing. Uh, for me, that was uh, really a good part of the job. As to interesting things, I don't know. I, I guess my, uh, uh, I always think of a lawyer that came into our court. This is when we first started up and the lawyer stood up at the podium and said may and the lawyer fainted <laughs> literally literally fainted in the courtroom and uh, you know the, the the enormity I suppose of what the lawyer was about to do just uh, came over the lawyer and, and I, I always remember that as something that happened while I was on the bench how long did it take before the lawyer came to again? <laughs> well, we, fortunately, one of the attorney generals was a certified EMT, and uh, she, she, uh, she helped the lawyer and 
I think we put it off until the next day so the lawyer could recover. <laughs> so that, they are two of my memories. Did, did you rule for him or against him? I, I, can't, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. It would be a shame if he ruled against the poor, <laughs> poor person. <laughs> I'd faint again. <laughs> <laughs> The rest of you. Well, you know, the thing that I remember most about um, our experience on the Court of Appeals, uh, in addition to the, the tremendous professional satisfaction and, and what I think we were able to accomplish for, for people, uh, the litigants who came before us, is the wonderful bonds of friendship that we formed. I mean, and, and it, it came about so naturally and so spontaneously. We got together after court. If we were out of court for the day at three, we, people who played tennis would play tennis. Those who didn't might watch and make fun of them. You know, we'd all get together. Um, if somebody was in Northern Virginia, I'd have people come over to my house. Uh, Lawrence would have people. We would all exchange, um, we were friends. And, and, you know, just enduring friends. And we were talking about this just when we got here today that you know, the test of a wonderful friendship is it takes you about, you know, no matter how long it's been since you've seen someone, it takes you just a few minutes to revert back to form and be right where you are enjoying each other's company. And uh, to me, that is one of the priceless things that, that I've taken away from, from my time on the court. Well, I, I would reiterate what Barbara said. I mean, we, over the years, we all socialized together. We, when we were on a panel together, we would go out to dinner and go to Birchmere in Northern yeah. Virginia to things <laughs> and, and have visited each other's home. We know a lot about everybody's personal life as far as uh, children and divorces and everything yeah. else that, uh, that we've experienced. So I think we all have a close bond of friendship that uh, is rare on a court since we we did come on together. One of the things that uh, I would like to share, uh, Bernard Barrow, who was one of the original members, a very good friend of mine, and we did a lot of things together. And uh, he called me one day and asked me if I would like to go fly fishing. He knew I had some interest in fly fishing. So I told him I would, and he said, well, there's a school that we can go to, an Orvis school. <laughs> and I said, well, let's go. Where is it? And he said, well, it's in Napa Valley. <laughs> so I said, well, let's try to find a place a little closer to home, Bernard. <laughs> so we did and found a place in North Carolina, and he came, came down, and he and I went to, to the school together. Uh, he followed up on it a little bit, but it's become a passion of my life now, and I, uh, over the years, uh, have... Uh, I fish a lot, and I attribute it all to Bernard, what, what a great influence it was uh, on me, and it's been a, a great uh, diversion for me over the years. And if I could jump right in here for just one second, even though it's not my turn, I also introduced Sam, or went on his first date with him, <laughs> with right. his wife, Kathy. <laughs> Kathy was a, a, a wonderful employee of the Supreme Court of Virginia for, what, 30 years or 20-some right. years. She was the director of judicial planning. She was fabulous. We loved Sam. We loved Kathy. It was so obvious that they should get together, but they just never did. So I said, okay, we're going to go out on a date, the three of us. And we went to Stella's in Richmond, right. and they discovered they both loved to fish, and the rest is history. <laughs> so we had other impacts on, uh, on each other's lives well, other since, than just the since, law. Since we're talking about Sam, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I knew Sam was a great fisherman, and I like to surf fish in the ocean. And so I convinced Sam to go <laughs> surf fishing with me. And we were fishing off Virginia Beach, and Sam was catching this fish. Uh, and we eventually started calling it the Gate City Flounder. <laughs> right. And they were all skates. That's all he caught the whole day was skates. Well, I'd like to edit this part out where I related the fishing part of that as being one of the memories of this because I don't want to leave Kathy out of this because actually Barbara Keenan and uh, Joanna Fitzpatrick kept asking me, why don't you ask Kathy Mays out? Why don't you ask Kathy Mays out? She's such a wonderful person. And I'd had dealings with her. I, she was in the uh, executive secretary's office, and she was uh, and continues to be a wonderful person. And I said, well, I live in southwest Virginia. It's so far to carry on a uh, courtship of any kind. And I just kept putting it off and putting it off. And finally, Barbara did set up our meeting together, which led to uh, my arranging to have a 
fly fishing trip with Chief Justice Carrico because he had expressed an interest in learning to fly fish and Kathy. <laughs> so I called and I told her that I'd come up and meet one day and take them both out and teach them a few of the basics. Well, in the meantime, Chief Justice Carrico had gotten engaged. He had no interest in learning to fly fish. <laughs> Kathy didn't tell me that. <laughs> so I showed up at a designated time ready to take Kathy out to uh, go fly fishing and when she showed up, with a bottle of wine, I thought something else is on her mind other than fly fishing. So I knew that you and Joanna had been up to no good for that. So, but that uh, is one of, one of the wonderful things that has happened to me since I've been on the Court of Appeals is Mary and Kathy Mays, who they all know. What a wonderful story, <laughs> Judge Moon. Well, after I went on this court, I was in a bank building. I didn't see any lawyers. I like I saw the ups man and. <laughs> and uh, no lawyers, no judges around me at all. So what I enjoyed most was getting together, as they said, with, with, the, with the other judges, particularly uh, with, I was on for some time, it was a panel I was on with Judge Barra and Judge Keenan, and uh, we would come to Richmond and handle about 20 or 30 cases, I think, you know, in, in a day, uh, two days. And um, these were petitions that had to be done, but we expedited them. But we had a great time. We, of course, we went to Dunham, and we had a. It was just, it was, type of experience I wasn't having back in the bank. <laughs> so I think that's what I enjoyed most was just the, the socializing with the other judges. Well, all of you obviously bonded um, very beautifully together. And you had a, an enormous caseload. And I was wondering, as you kind of collectively look back on those cases, um, were there any cases or, or types of cases that really, um, that you remember that really impacted the way that you, you viewed your role on the court or that the role that, that the court played in this, these types of cases, cases that maybe you found to be particularly challenging or cases that really profoundly impacted you personally? Well, the uh, professor in you is coming out. That's a hard question. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I guess I would go, I'd have to think about it longer than time would permit now, but I think the whole area, as we have discussed, uh, of the equitable distribution statute and interpreting it uh, and having a sense that we are we're clarifying it for the trial judges and the practicing bar, um, I found that very satisfying, satisfying because I had tried so many of those cases. Um, or similar cases as a circuit judge, I was never real sure that what I was doing was right. I hoped it was, but um, I always thought, well, if I were still a trial judge, I would really appreciate what the court's doing. So that was very satisfying to me. I think the other area that we maybe uh, affected the change was in the workers' comp area. Mm -hmm. I think that oh, yeah. at some point we, a number of us concluded that um, the test that the Supreme Court was using to define certain kinds of workers' comp injuries probably was not the best and could have been better shaped. And uh, I think our cases eventually got there, and I think the Virginia Supreme Court got there also. So I, I, I found the area of workers' comp was an area that I thought we had, a, had an influence on the development of the law. I think it was in, uh, very uh, challenging and, and satisfying, too, in the criminal law area, where the Supreme Court had always been such a conservative court. And here we were starting our new court, and uh, most of us had a little bit more uh, expansive view of individual rights and constitutional rights. And so it was particularly satisfying to be able to render opinions that recognize those rights and to also try to do it in a way that wouldn't get them reversed because the Supreme Court did have uh, the next line up and final place in Virginia was the Supreme Court of Virginia. So we were uh, always trying to uh, 
kind of watch our backs, you know, trying to, uh, in, in making these decisions, uh, tailor them so that they did mesh with existing law, even though we were nudging out the boundaries of individual rights. Mm -hmm. Well, I would agree that certainly the equitable distribution and the workers' comp area were areas where uh, we made a tremendous impact on the change. And this, I guess my comment that I'd like to make now is sort of unresponsive to the question in a way, but I think it's timely, particularly in view of the cases that are being argued before the United States Supreme Court today and yesterday, and that's the DOMA case and the gay lesbian mm -hmm. marriage case. Uh, in thinking about those, I, I thought about a case that we decided years ago, the Sharon Bottoms case, mm -hmm. and three of us were involved in one way or another on that, on that case, but it was a custody dispute between the mother of a child who, was engaged, who became engaged in a lesbian relationship and her mother who was trying to take uh, custody of the child away. Mm -hmm. And the court, the circuit court, had awarded custody to the grandmother. And in order to do that, the law would have required that there be a finding of unfitness as far as a parent is concerned before you can award custody to a non-parent. So that was our review. The standard review was whether or not the lesbian relationship rendered her unfit. And the trial judge made findings that would indicate that other than that, she was a fit parent. But the immoral relationship, I think, was expressed in there, and that it was actually at the time considered to be illegal, even though I don't think it was ever enforced. But she, uh, custody of the child was taken from her, and we reviewed that, and we, in a unanimous opinion, Judge Moon and I and Judge Elder were actually on that, that mm -hmm. case, and we reversed and sent it back for further hearings, and that, that was appealed to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, in a divided opinion, 4-3 opinion, reversed us and held that the, the uh, immoral relationship uh, was uh, prohibited the mother from having custody of the child. And Judge uh, Justice Keenan at the time, I will report, was in the dissent on that. She was in the 4-3, she wanted to uphold our opinion, but, you know, I think of that, uh, changes that have been made sociologically and having adopt gay parents adopting and surrogate parents and mm -hmm. the, thing, the changes that have been made since that time, and I believe that was a 1994 case, I believe. I think we got 94, it. 95. 95, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess uh, seeing the development of the law in that case, uh, you know, is something that um, I think ultimately our court has proven to be right in that. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, it shows how the law develops, and that's, mm -hmm. that was part of it. And the irony of that case was that the grandmother who got the child had raised the mother mm -hmm. in a home with a man to whom she was not married who had molested the lesbian mother. And she, that was mm -hmm. the thing that got me about Well, and that. there was a lot of friction on the Virginia <clears throat> Supreme Court when that case was being, I mean, there was a, a mm -hmm. lot of, um, Lawrence, I don't know if you, I don't think, no, you hadn't joined us because Justice Lacey and I Justice. Came in I don't, yeah. yeah, I wrote the dissent, and Justice Lacey and Justice Whiting joined right. me mm -hmm. in the dissent. Yeah. And um, just as an aside, I remember one of the justices when we were walking out after the conference. It wasn't the f most enjoyable conference because of how strongly people felt about the issue. And I remember one of the uh, justices said to me, and I had never expressed an interest in any kind of additional appointment. But he said, you've just cooked your goose. You'll never be pointed to a federal court. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Interesting aside, but uh, people's, people were just feeling so strongly on that issue. Um, I mean, one of the judges said, I couldn't go to church on Sunday if I voted that way. And, I mean, you know, and, and, and this was something that was just, uh, there was nothing wrong with this woman. It, uh, but the to, to some of the judges, it was just so fundamentally um, uh, problematic that, that, that her sexual orientation was different from most people, or perceived to be different from most people. And, um, and it, it, it was very, very hard. I mean, those issues were, 
Right. As Sam said, I mean, they were big, and there was a, a lot of difficult discussion surrounding them even at the time. Well, it sounds to me as if the court was really um, in the f in the in the front uh, of really paving the way for the way in which we think of these kinds of issues today. And all of you are responsible for that. And I'd like to ask you one last question, and that is, how do you want your role and how do you want the court to be remembered? Um, since you all were there at ground zero, you were there at the beginning, you were there forming this court, how do you want your role and how do you want the court's role to be remembered? And since I have hammered poor Justice Kuntz uh, to start this off, uh, uh, all my questions off, I'm going to defer to Judge Moon and ask him if he would start. Well, I think the, the court has met its mission. I think they have achieved everything the legislature um, thought the court should do. And I believe, and, and that's what uh, I'm proud of uh, for what little role I ha had in, in that occurring. And uh, I just would like to, for my own uh, legacy, whatever it be, I would like for people to think that I did, did, did a good job and uh, was, didn't stand in the way of somebody who might have done better. Well, I think all of us, when we were expressing our view of those judges that we had looked up to, we emphasized that um, fairness was something that we uh, were impressed by in all of them. And, uh, you know, I, I guess we are, our legacy will be whatever we have done without thinking about it, to tell you the truth. And I, I suppose I, I want to be remembered as, as being fair and, and willing to listen and willing to consider other points of view rather than closed-minded, which, you know, I, judges um, should not be and cannot be, I don't think, to be good, to be, can be closed-minded. And unfortunately, there are uh, some that uh, can't see any, any side but their own, own view. So uh, I guess that's, that's the way I'd like to be remembered. I'd like to, to be remembered as the, a member of the court that brought the law closer to the people, that we helped uh, by giving people a second opportunity to have their case considered when ordinarily they wouldn't get a second look in the legal system. And I think that, you know, one time when you go through the system, if, if you think you've been unfairly treated, if you go then to a second form where they give you a written decision telling you why you lose, um, I think people are, are, are more able to accept, they can still be very disappointed, but more able to be, accept the fact that at least somebody listened, somebody heard, and somebody told them why. And that's how I'd like to be remembered. I want to adopt what Barbara just said. I don't think I can say it any better. Uh, I, I, I think that that uh, really speaks for my sense about what we try to do on the court. Well, uh, for me personally, uh, if anybody cares to remember me, I would like to be, uh, for it to be known, uh, how aware I was at the time and am today of what uh, a great opportunity I had to be where I was when the court came along. It was intellectually satisfying, it was personally satisfying, and I just think I was lucky to have such a uh, a unique professional opportunity. Insofar as what the court um, means uh, to me, I, I sort of agree with Jim, what everybody has already said, um, as is, was always usual in my working with them uh, when we were all together on the Court of Appeals, I agree with what they're saying. This was, this was an important addition to the judicial system of the Commonwealth. And I will always believe that we complied with our mission, and I think the court still is, and I'm very proud of that. 
thank you all for your time. This has been an incredible journey into the lives, each of your lives, but also the life of the court. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.